Hey everybody, welcome to episode one of this coaching vlog. This chair I'm sitting on keeps sinking, so I think by the end of the day, <laughs> I'll be way down here, but we'll do the rest, okay? So what I thought about doing was taking some topics that we've discussed in our coaches mentoring group and put it together into more of a polished format and distribute that once a week and also answer your questions and things and stuff. So. This is a rehash of a discussion that we had on September 26, 2017, so it's been about six months, and it was inspired by one of our coaches that's in our group, Paige. She posted on Instagram and said, I put on my big girl pants and registered for my level two in November because Ray basically said he wasn't impressed by my level one last week. Hashtag heard loud and clear. And it's been over a year, so I guess it's the right time too. So my question to y'all is, how did you prepare for the level two, besides the obvious of studying for the workbook and materials provided, and did anything catch you off guard that you can help a sister out on? So for those of you who are interested in taking the level two, this is for you. Now, in no particular order, here are some things that you can do to get the most out of the level two seminar. The first thing is to freaking go. You heard me. I said freaking go to the level two. It should not be a question of if you should go. It should be a question of when. If you are coaching on a regular basis, you should be going to the level two course. Um, let me give you an example here. So level twos, in my opinion, are a penny a dozen. They're not even a dime a dozen. They're a penny a dozen. In San Diego alone, we have about 650 level one trainers. That number is probably higher now. Of those, we have about 100-ish level twos, that's 15% of the coaches in San Diego being a level two. And I think at, right now we have maybe 12 or 13, maybe 14 level threes in San Diego. And a level three is very different from a level one. There's a lot of experience there. There's a lot of hours coaching. There's a lot of wisdom there. It's very different. And now we call the level one the kernel. It's the kernel. It's a little cute little seed that turns into that big corn plant. So it's a great start. But it's not the end all. If you are consistently coaching, if you're trying to make a career out of coaching CrossFit, you need to have at least a level two. I know it's $1,000. I know it's expensive, but it's worth it. You got to go. Not only will you leave the course with an overflowing quiver of shiny new arrows for your coaching arsenal, but you'll also set yourself up from the novices. Level ones are novices. It's a great start. The level one course is awesome. I've taught about 30, some of them, in the last four years, and every time I go, I pick up something new, or I have one of those aha moments, like, oh, that's what that means. So to think that you can go to this course once and feel like you're prepared to be a CrossFit professional, it's a little presumptuous, a little pretentious. It's a good start. A lot of CrossFitters think that the muscle up is the end all movement. It's like once I get the muscle up, I'm going to arrive. But in competitive gymnastics, the muscle up now says, congratulations, you may begin your routine. So if you're a level one trainer, do not be satisfied with just a level one. It's the beginning. It's a nice, it's the gateway drug to awesomeness. Now, common objections that we hear all the time is I can't afford it. Well, can you really not afford it? Honestly, after taking the level one, you start setting aside maybe $83 a month. By the time you have a year experience, you should have that money set aside and you're ready to go. Some gym owners will actually subsidize the cost of this course. So ask. It doesn't hurt to ask, right? Some gym owners offer incentives for continuing education. I know in my gym when I was running my affiliate, I told all my coaches, hey, you're making X number of dollars as a level one. When you get your level two, you'll make a little bit more. When you get your level three, you'll make even more. When you take specialty courses, you get a little bit more. In general, you need to have a mindset that you're gonna continue learning and growing. That should be a non-negotiable as a coach. It scares me when people say, oh, I'm good. And I'm like, okay, are you really? Like, I don't want to follow you. And I've told my, I told my coaches before, I said, if I ever say that I've arrived, stop following me. I'm ignorant, I'm arrogant, and I don't know what I'm talking about. Because the reality is, the more that I learn, the more I realize I don't know anything. And so, again, can you really afford not to go? Up to this point, I've been to about six or seven level two courses, including my CPC back in 2012 when that's what the level two course was called. And every single time I go, I still learn something new. 
And so, again, I reiterate, how, if you've only been to, to the level one once, how can you say that you're an expert? And if you've never been to the level two, you don't really know what you don't know. You don't. And that's the big thing I want to focus on. You don't know what you don't know. And so you got to go. Now, when you decide to go, because I know that you're a reasonable person and you will go, because now that I've guilted you into it, really is what it is. Number one, in order to be successful at the level two course, you need to understand the foundational movements, the nine foundational movements. The air squat, the front squat, the overhead squat, the press, the push press, the push jerk, the deadlift, the sumo deadlift high pull. Yes, it actually is a useful movement. Some people will object and... I, I used to be one of those people, and now I actually really see the utility and why it's so elegantly put in there. I'll explain that more a little bit later, maybe, or maybe a different video, but anyway, I digress. Med ball clean. Um, here's another thing you should do. Critically observe as many people as possible. Study movement. Develop your eye for subtlety. Um, do this especially while you're coaching, but take time to observe other coaches what, when you're not coaching. One of the most beneficial things that I ever did was I would drive 45 minutes north to Coach B's house every Wednesday just to watch him coach. And I would fixate on the people that he was watching and I would watch that athlete and then I would look at Coach B and listen to what he was observing and what he was cueing them on. And I would take mental notes. Did I see what he saw? And if I didn't see what I saw, I would look for it again later. And so that's one really good way to develop your eye for subtle faults. At the level two course, one of the things that we often will see is that coaches are not very good at seeing faults. And if you can't see faults, you can't correct faults. Let me give you another example. The first time I did the level one seminar staff internship, back then they let the interns teach the entire squat session. And if you remember from your level one course, the squat session is anywhere between 50 and 60 minutes, depending on how efficient the flow master is running the course. <laughs> I didn't say that, but it should be about 55 minutes to 60 minutes. And I got done with the air squat, the front squat, and the overhead squat in 26 minutes. So I'm looking at these movers, and I'm like, well, it looks good to me. I don't see anything wrong. And so I look over at Todd Woodman, who was awesome, and I go, hey, Todd, do you have anything to add? And he goes, yeah, I love this stuff. And he jumps in, and he goes, dude, you guys are great movers, but we can, move you, we can make you better. And, I, and he proceeds to melt my face off. I'm watching him look at all these subtle, nuancy things, or... There probably weren't even nuanced. I think my eyes just sucked and I didn't see basic faults. But I was watching him make these people squat better and I didn't even quite understand it at the time. I was just like, that looks better. I don't know why it looks better. And I don't really understand what he did, what he did to make it look better. But he did something. And clearly I was missing something. And here's the thing, guys. Especially if you train at a small gym and you see the same people every single day, you tend to get lazy. Because you know that Jimmy doesn't have mobility. And Janie is just too lazy and doesn't want to squat below parallel. And, you know, so you know, you know everyone's quirks. And by that point, you're not really looking anymore. You're just autopilot. So as a trainer for HQ and for weightlifting staff, I have the benefit of seeing 40 to 60 new people every weekend. And so that keeps my eyes fresh. Now, if you're coaching in a small gym, that can be a little tough because you have the same people all the time. So here's some things you can do. Watch videos on YouTube. YouTube is great. Go visit another coach and ask, hey, can I just sit in and, and observe you coaching and look critically at people's movement? And keep in mind all the points of performance of all the movements. Are in the squat, for instance, is everyone keeping their heels down or are they collapsing into their ankles? Are they driving their knees out or are their knees going valgus or pointing in? Um, are people butt winking in the bottom? Do you know the difference between a butt wink and loss of lumbar? What about the thoracic spine? What's it doing? Is it staying upright or is it overextended or is it totally rolled in like this mashed potato what about their overhead position are they shrugging the crap out of it and it looks like this in the overhead position or does it look nice and crisp and they're pressing up like this you got to see those subtleties that's super important you want to develop an eye for noticing things that are out of place do this especially while you're coaching but take time to observe other classes while you're not coaching it's really really easy to get comfortable with your own people you know their common faults you have seen them over and over again. Watch people you've never worked with. Challenge yourself. The next thing, learn and use the progressions from the level one course. This should be a no brainer. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. These progressions are tried and true. If you need to modify for people, that's fine. But use our progressions as a template. They're good, they actually work. 
Well, sometimes for people, if you really need to regress the progression, if they're really, really struggling, it's okay to add little steps backwards or in between. But for the most part, make sure you know our progressions. I was quizzing someone the other day, someone who was uh, getting ready to intern for the first time on level one seminar staff. And I asked her, what's the progression for the push press? And she froze. She's like, well, uh, well, you, uh, that you should just know it's dip and hold, dip, drive, slow, dip, drive, fast, dip, drive, press. And more than knowing the progression, you should also understand why each step is there. Every, every step on the progression is on purpose. Your reps, when you're calling reps in the group, should be on purpose. There should be a reason for the reps, not just to make people move and get them sweaty. That's stupid. We want to make people better. So, for instance, on the push press, the purpose of the dip and hold is so that they know where the dip is. The easiest cue that I've heard, I stole this from one of my coaches that I mentor. I steal cues from my from my mentors all the time. It's kind of a um, symbiotic relationship. Is he said, uh, just unlock your knees. I was like, that's genius. Because all you really need to do to do an effective dip is just barely crack the knees open. We want the shoulders and hips and heels to be stacked over each other. That's the only thing that's moving, right, is the knees. So we un unlock the knees, we bend slightly, and that's our dip. We want to make sure that everything stays nice and upright in the dip for the push press. That's the purpose there. So when you're calling the reps, dip and hold, or if you just say, keep it simple, it's just down, you look around. You're like, okay, is everyone stacked? Shoulders over hips, over heels. If yes, we can move on, give them a high five. If someone's out of place, like, hey, I need your shoulders back a little bit more. Or, hey, I need your hips to come forward. Or, hey, I need your abs to be tighter. So as long as you know the purpose of each step, it's going to be a whole lot easier to see faults. The second thing, on the dip and hold, the dip drive slow. Now the point is, okay, can they dip with some movement and then go back up with control and still go in the right direction? And then the third step, dip drive fast. This is where things go awry often. People are dip really fast and drive really fast and it's like a big mess. So one thing that I encourage people to do is to dip slow and then drive fast. Making sure to keep that torso upright as they go down. We don't want them to lean forward, that's bad. So keep it nice and upright. The dip, again guys, doesn't have to be fast. The dip often, especially when the weight is heavy, if you do the spastic dip, everything's gonna fall apart. So control the dip and then drive fast. And then we do the full movement. And now what we're looking for is we're looking for the timing. So again, you can see that every step of the progression has a purpose. And with that purpose has an associated fault. On the dip and pause, if they're leaning forward, that's the static fault. And it helps you to see the static fault when you force them to pause, doesn't it? Now on the dip drive slow, we're looking for that same point in performance. We want to make sure torso stays upright with motion. Then the dip drive fast, we add the other point in performance where we have speed, right? So we want to see them dip vertical, drive vertical, and do it quickly. And then we put it all together. And now the most important fault to look for in the end of the push press is the timing. We want to make sure that they are driving with the legs first, then they press over. And not some weird, okay, they press early, so they're pressing dip, press early. Or sometimes they'll dip and press, they'll dip and drive and press at the same time instead of actually... What has to happen is the legs carry through and then the press happens. So sometimes when I demo this, I'll actually exaggerate it where I'll go. I'll go here, I'll go dip, boom, brat drive. And then make it a little bit faster and faster so that they can see the distinction there. So really, really important, make sure that you know the progressions, you know why each step is there, and know the associated faults for those progressions. For every movement that doesn't have a progression, develop a teaching plan that highlights each of the points of performance. Practice teaching the progressions and using a plan. Do it the same way every time. Develop some consistency. You should be able to teach the squat in your sleep. One of the biggest things that we'll often do with people at the level two course is they'll, they'll do their first breakout and they'll teach the squat, for instance, and they're done in two minutes. And I was like, uh, that's it. There's like a million things you could have fixed there. Do you not see those things? Having a plan not only directs the way you're going to teach the movement, but also directs the way you're going to see the faults. Okay? It's okay to do some reps. Just do five reps. Okay, if you don't see any faults, cool, let's move on. But don't just go, okay, ready, squat, stand, squat, stand, I'm done. Seen it. And what sucks about that is now on your second chance to coach, 
we're going over very basic things. Super basic things. You should already have an effective plan on how to teach the squat. People who have done this right, when they come to the course, they have a good plan, they execute their plan, and then we're able to give them more advanced cues and more advanced assistance, more advanced feedback. And they walk away from the course much better off than someone who came in and was barely prepared. You want to get the most out of this course as you can, right? So it would behoove you to prepare. Don't be that guy that says, okay, I'm going to teach a squat. It takes five minutes and I'm done. No. I can take 25 minutes or 30 minutes working on someone's squat. And finding those little things, making, those, making them fight for millimeters. Even good movers can move better. And that's what we need, to, we need to strive for. We need to be able to see those things. Now, having a plan is going to help us do that. Having a plan, again, I mentioned this earlier, helps direct our eyes to certain faults. There's a very common mistake with coaches where, is where they'll watch an athlete and they're like looking for every possible fault. Now, I learned this from Matt Loden. He's one of our flow masters, level one, level two, one of the best coaches I've ever worked with. And he said, if you look for everything, you'll find nothing. But if you pick the fault, try to find the offender. So with a set of reps, I'm just going to pretend, let's say, I'm looking for loss of lumbar in the bottom of the squat. Ready, everybody? I scan the group. And I, I zone in on one person, I say squat, and I look. Loss of lumbar? Nope, pretty good. Move on to the next person. Ready, everybody? And squat? Ooh, okay, that was not so pretty. Hey, and you just keep your abs tighter on this next rep, okay? Everyone stand. And then I zone in on that person again. Ready, and squat? Better. Not what I want, but better. And stand. And you, so, so you see the process here. I am, basically what I'm doing is, when I say ready, I look around the group. I look at everyone's setup. We call this static scanning. Okay, cool. Everyone looks good. Or if someone's out of place, I'll say, hey, I need your feet a little wider. Hey, abs tight. Hey, shoulders back. Everyone's ready now. And when I say squat, I'm looking at one person. My eyes are fixated on that one person, looking for the one fault that I'm looking for. And if I find an offense, I cue it. If it looks good, I tell them, hey, that looks great. Cool, let's move on. And then, Notice also that before I release them, I look around again. I look at the static positions. Okay, So having a plan and having um, a plan of what faults to look for in each set of reps is going to help you see those very subtle faults. Okay, Again, I bring this up because I want you to get the most out of this course. If we have a coach that comes in with an amazing plan and they execute their plan, it allows us as trainers of the course to give you more advanced feedback. So you can leave even better than you came in. We want you guys to be better. And you're not going to get better if you come in all lazy and don't have a plan. I mean, if you don't don't have a plan, you're going to plan to fail, right? I think that's what they're saying. But again, I keep repeating myself. Come with a plan. Next thing, get your reps in. You want to teach as many classes as you can. Grab another coach and practice each day. Practice teaching each other every day. One of the things that I did when I ran my affiliate was every week we would get together with our coaches and we would just practice teaching each other movement. We would play around with practicing faults. Very, very important skill for every coach is to A, be good at demonstrating the movements well, but also be good at demonstrating the movements poorly. Especially when you're using visual cues, like you want to be able to make a contrast, like, hey, you're doing this, what I really want you to do is this. And that's going to require some self-awareness. Some coaches lack self-awareness. They think they're demoing it great. And all of a sudden, we're sitting there scratching our heads and like, you just said you didn't want them to do that, but that's what you just did. So that's why it's really important to get your reps in, practice coaching with someone else, and keep each other accountable. The other thing, too, is the more people that you work with, the more seasoned your eyes are going to be to spotting faults. I mentioned this earlier. The other thing, too, is not all cues are going to work for everyone. So if you can collect as many cues as possible, that's really going to help you in the long run. So the more people that you coach, the more people you're going to have opportunity to provide cues. If cues aren't working, you got to come up with something and be creative. Next thing, be humble (laughs) and be prepared to get feedback. You will get feedback. That is our job. And we always thank our participants in advance. Thank you. You're getting into a place where you're going to be uncomfortable. We're going to pick you apart can't go in there like with a big ego and be like, I know everything. Because you will get humbled. Like uh, CrossFit 858 used to have this t-shirt that said, be humble or be humbled. You got to have that mindset when you come to the level two. 
Even the best coaches can get better. Our craft is one that is infinitely refinable. Remember that phrase from the level one? Infinitely refinable. So be prepared to be uncomfortable. Remember that the comfort zone is a nice place to be, but nothing grows there. Being on HQ staff, we get feedback every single seminar, for every single lecture, for every single thing that we do so that we can continue to evolve and continue to get better. You are not going to go very far as a coach unless you are teachable, unless you are coachable, unless you are willing to be picked apart. It's not for the faint of heart. Coaching is not for the faint of heart. We are here because we care about people. And in order for us to care for people, we need to be open to seeing that we have faults too. And it's through those faults that we are able to learn and able to make people the best that they can be. After the level two, keep practicing everything you learned at the level two. <laughs> Stay in touch with your instructors. They'll give you their email. Say, send them questions. We love to get questions from our participants. Find a group of people to practice coaching with. Shameless self-promotion, I actually run a group that was designed for this purpose. I remember when I went to my coach's prep course, I was... I didn't want the weekend to end. I was like, I want to stay here forever. I just want to keep learning. I want I want the Miranda to keep telling me that, that my coaching sucks. I want Russell Berger to keep picking away at the way I keep saying um and um and things like that. Um, I want Boz to be here all the time to tell me all these little tricks that I can do to help coach people better. So that's the purpose of this group that I started, this mentoring group, is that I want to create an environment, a community where coaches can come together, they can nerd out about stuff, and they can continue to grow using the stuff they learn at these seminars. This group is not meant to replace the seminars. In fact, it's, it's a really great go-between. I got athlete co coaches coming in. With, they took their level two. They took the strongman. They took the adaptive course. They took this. They took that. And we get to talk about all these awesome things. And it's just a nice way for these courses to continue on. So that feeling that I had, like, I don't want this to end. It didn't have to end. It doesn't have to end for anyone. And the cool thing is that we continue to grow together. So, again, in review, the best way to get the most out of the level two course is to go. It's not if you should go, it is when should you go. And my answer is about six months to a year. I know a guy who actually took the level two two months after his level one and he crushed it. But the guy was just exceedingly intelligent and very, very coachable. So there are exceptions to the rule, but in general, you want to get a few hours in, a few hundred hours coaching so that you have some experience coaching the progressions, using your plan. That way, again, you can get more out of the course and more out of the feedback your instructors will give you. Again, understand the nine foundational movements. That's crucial. Critically observe as many people as possible. Develop your eye for subtlety. That's what we need you to do. Seeing and correcting is probably one of the biggest things that we see lacking in level one trainers is they just don't see faults. And that's a problem. We want you to be able to see faults. That's how you make people better. You can't correct people if you're not seeing faults, especially the subtle ones. We want you to learn and use the progressions from the level one course. Again, I repeat, learn those progressions, use those progressions. They're great progressions. Get your reps in. Coach as many people as you can. Watch as many people as you can. Be humble and be prepared for feedback. And then after the level two, Find someone, find a mentor who will be able to continue to invest in you, who will continue to challenge you, who will give you feedback on your coaching, or find a community like ours. All right, guys, if you have any questions, you can post them in the comments below, and hopefully I'll make this a weekly habit of posting useful things. If you have any requests on topics, I'm open to that stuff. Unless I hear from you, I'll probably just take old topics from our calls and use those. So, send me things to do. Cool. See you guys next time.